Hi everyone, this is GKCS. We are talking about a topic called Bloom filters today. Uh, and the reason why we are talking about this is because in compared programming, often you have to find some properties of strings. So you don't want to actually store the entire string to compare it with another string. You want to store the hash of these strings so that the comparison is efficient. Right? So if you have a hash of something, it's just one number. And uh, the hash of the other thing is going to be a single number, so it will be a single comparison. On the other hand, if you're comparing two strings, that is an order m plus n operation, right? Because the length of the first string and the length of the second string. Now, there are interesting data structures around strings, which are tries, suffix, uh, trees, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, for example, tries, it's not easy to actually optimize them for any given problem. So even though they have really good theoretical complexity, uh, in practice, their complexity is not that great. Okay, so in practice, hashing is one of the best approaches you can have for uh, problems where you need to compare a lot of strings. So one of the things you can do is just use a hash map. Why not? So a hash map is a sensible data structure. In this in this hash map, what could possibly happen is you do not have the bucket range required to store that many strings. So let's say in the hash map, the range of indexes you can have, the range of hash you can have is from 0 to some number m, right? So m is not very large. What you can do to compensate then is to actually store multiple hashes, right? So that will be another hash which is going from range 0 to n, another hash which is going from 0 to what comes after n, o. Yeah, but it looks like 0, so I'll make it q, and so on and so forth. So you're seeing that you take one string, you pass it through three hash functions, and then you get you know three numbers. So let's say x1, x2, and x3. Now, if you get a separate string, a new string, and if you pass it through these three hash functions, and you get the same numbers, there's a very, very high probability that that string is the same string as the one that you had initially, right? So for example, if I have A, B, C as my string, um, and I pass it through the hash functions to get 6, 9, and 12, if I have the string A, B, D, there's a very low probability that passing it through the same hash functions will give me the same numbers. Okay, so that's the general concept of Bloom filters. So Bloom filters is a, a special kind of data structure. I'll just explain it over here. This is something that Facebook also uses for um, avoiding one hit wonders, right? So what's a one hit wonder? For example, let's say you search for an amoeba. I don't even know if that's the right spelling, but uh, let's say you search for an amoeba and you know, you never really search for amoeba as such. So it's a one hit thing. And your local storage, your browser stores the results that you are searching for. And the reason for this is so that everything is efficient. The next time you search for amoeba, there's a good chance that it won't need to ask the server for the page. Instead, it's just going to get it from here, right? So there'll be an entry of amoeba over here. Now, a one hit wonder is something that you search just once. So what's happening is because you searched for this, it got stored in the cache, but now it's occupying space in the cache which could have been used by something else, something that you are far more likely to search. And if you use policies like least recently used in the cache, which is a very common policy for a cache, then amoeba is probably going to kick out some other entry which was more likely to be searched by you. For example, if you're in this channel, then probably coding is something that you search often. And for some reason, some, something relevant to coding just got kicked out of the cache to put in an amoeba. Overall, what's happening is that because your cache is poor, it's, it doesn't have the right results, relevant results, your overall performance is going to be slow. So your experience in the, uh, while, while searching on the web is going to be poor, and therefore you will not like your browser. 
Facebook does something similar. If you're searching for a person or if you're searching for a particular page just once, it doesn't really want to save that in cache just yet. It wants you to search for it a few times. And then if it's sure that it's worth saving in its local cache, that's when it stores it. All right. So that's the general principle. Uh, and how come it's related to hashing? Because you can take that string, you can pass it through multiple hash functions, and you know store the store the numbers. The next time a person searches for the same thing, you check if these numbers are the same. If they are, that means that this person has searched for this string the second time, and is far more likely to go on searching for it again and again. So if you're interested in something, you'll probably you know look for it more and more. So that's the general idea of the bloom filter all right so let's try to understand what this data structure actually works like the simplest kind of bloom filter is an array of bits in this let's say you have from index 0 to m minus 1 so the size of the array is m and you have bits all set to zero, right? Now you search for a particular string, let's say um, cat, right? And you pass it through the hash functions h1, h2, and h3. So when you pass these three, when you pass uh, this argument cat to these three functions, what you're going to get are numbers three, seven and two okay a hash function if you don't know what a hash function is you should have a look in the description below uh, and definitely not move forward <laughs> with this video because it's going to be using a lot of hashing in fact i think there are some problems that we have solved using hashing so you can have a look at those also uh, they'll be in the description so you get these three numbers what we are going to do is we are going to take these indexes and set them to one so that'll be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and index number 8. So index number 7 is set to 1. Index number 2 is set to 1. And index number 3 is set to 1. Now, let us say someone comes up with another string, mat. So again, it's passed through these three hash functions. And the three numbers we are getting because the string is similar, I'm going to say that, you know, what, take the first character and divide it by eight. Take the second character, divide it by eight, and take the third character and divide it by eight. So let's say these two numbers are the same because the second and the third character is the same. So you get seven and two here, but the first character is different from C. So there's a good chance that the first character is not the same, right? So I'll, I'll just call it four. Now have a look at this. I know that cat was searched. In fact, I don't really care whether cat was searched or not. I'm more interested in knowing whether mat has been searched previously or not. So looking at the numbers four, seven, and two, I come to seven, or rather I come to four first, and I see that this number is zero. I come to seven, I see that this number is one. And I come to two, and I see that this number is also 1. I'll take all these three numbers and check that whether all of them are set to 1 or not. All right. If all of them are set to 1, I'm going to assume that the string s, which is mat in our case, has been searched. Okay. Now, of course, the hash functions I've chosen are terrible, uh, and you you can find much better hash functions. But for the simple example, we are seeing that one zero one is not equal to one one one. Basically, all of them are not one. So therefore, mat has not been searched earlier, and we'll say that set set these three indexes, which is four. 7, it's already 1, and 2 to 1. All right, and 
we keep doing this every time we get a string to check if that string already exists or has already been searched or not right um, in this case what you're seeing is that there's just nine positions from zero to eight so what's going to very soon happen is that all of these positions will be set to one so because there are multiple searches and then you know these hash functions are large in number what's going to happen is all of these bits are going to set to one so the bloom filter also has a function of reset in which case if let's say 70 percent or 80 percent of the bits are already set then it's going to have a really poor probability of telling you whether the string has been searched or not therefore at that point you can reset this okay so some of the things that we are seeing about this is that it's a probabilistic data structure it's not a guarantee whether this string has been searched or not it's not even a guarantee that this string has not been searched or is it <laughs> actually it does guarantee you whether the string has not been searched in case you get even a single zero it's a guarantee that the string has not been searched the reason for that is because the hash functions are constant well, the hash functions h1 h2 and h3 are constant and every time you pass a string through them they'll give you the same result if that result has not been marked as true then you know that this string has not been searched so that's the speciality of bloom filters they are one approximate data structures but approximate only in telling you whether the string has been searched or not right if you find a single zero then you can guarantee that the string has not been searched and if you find all ones then there's a good probability that the strings have been searched right so now let's get into a little bit of the mathematical analysis behind this uh, and i'll just tell you what happens in an application so what, what happens in uh, let's say facebook is that if you see that the string has already been searched if this is 111 then it's stored in the browser's cache right the local cache and then next time again maybe someone searches for matt which is you know that's the assumption that if a person has been searching this for two or three times then you can just serve it from the local database of course you see that this can be extended to multiple layers so this is just one level which means that this string has been searched once right instead i'm going pretty quickly over this but you know you can you can go through the video again and again just to get an idea what you can have is multiple layers of the filter bloom filter so the first time it's set you don't you don't just uh, accept that it has been set once so if you get 111 let's say then you go to the next filter and then you check if it has been set twice or not so an example for this would be if let's say that this is 372 so the first time you would have 37 and 2 set the second time you meet this you again go over here to the next level and then set 37 and 2 to 111 in fact 2 has to be over here so yeah And then let's say when you come over here again, you go to the third level, and when this 372 is set to 111, that's the point when you know that this string has been searched four times because there are three bloom filters, right? So this is a multi level bloom filter. So after four searches, you're going to store this in the local database, right? So that won't be a one hit wonder, that will be a four hit wonder. This is highly unlikely to be done in a browser because it's not, it doesn't seem very efficient. But maybe if you're storing lots of data, then maybe you want to find the actual interest of a person in the long term. So four hits is a reasonable idea there. Okay. But in the context of compared programming, let's get back to analysis, which is mathematical. So let us say that you have n strings with you. So that would be n strings and the length of the bloom filter that you have is m this is the length of the bloom filter right the bloom filter is nothing but ones and zeros that's all 
So and um, the number of hash functions that you're going to be using is k. So for each of the strings, you're going to pass them through k hash functions uh, and then going to be setting therefore k bits in this bloom filter of size m. So taking an example now, uh, a concrete example, what we're going to do is we're going to take a string where assume 1, 2, 6 as the string and the hash says that I need to actually mod this with m by 2. All right, that's one of the hash functions. The other one is one to six mod m, and the final one is one to six mod m by three. Okay, so eight by three, or rather, m is nine, so nine by three gives you three. Over here, this is 9, and over here, this is 4. Okay, and the way that you get 1 to 6 through a string is going to be something like let's say A, B, C is your string. So A has value 1, B has value 2, and C has value 3. So I need 126. What I can do is I can say whatever value is here, multiply that by 100. So that is position 1, P1, plus whatever value is at position 2 has to be multiplied by 10, plus whatever value is at position 3 has to be multiplied by 2. So this is an assumption of the function which is going to give you this number, right? So f of this is this. And this comes out to be for A, B, C, it comes out to be 126. Okay. Now, this is just a number. The hash function itself is taking the remainder of 126 with 4. So the remainder of 126 with 4 is 2. Okay. Remainder of 126 with 9 is uh, you have 99, you have 108 you have 117, yeah, and 126. So this is zero actually, I think. 42, yeah, it's zero, perfect. And finally, then that this mod three is also going to give you zero. If it's divisible by nine, then it's divisible by three. So you see three hash functions uh, for, for the string one to, uh, one to six which is going to let us set bits at 0, 0, and 2. So this is 0, 0, and 2. OK. Now let's come to a different string, which is going to give us the same bits. So to take this example, let's reverse engineer it. Let's say that there's a hash, or there's a number which is going to give us 0 only zero for all three numbers for all three hash functions right is that possible so that number needs to be divisible by nine and that number needs to be divisible by four and also by three of course so nine into four 36 36 mod four gives you zero 36 mod nine gives you zero and 36 mod three gives you zero so this is an unlucky number for us right? If you're looking at it in this way, the answer could be f of, you can have c here and cc, right? So this is value 3, which is 3 into 10. And this is value 3. So that is 3 into 2. So that is 36. So cc is the other string that we have which is only going to let us set bit zero. Now what's going to happen with CC is that when we see this string, we are going to come to the bloom filter. We are going to see positions zero, zero, and zero, which is just one position, which is this position. We are going to see that 
for all the, of these three positions, the bit is set to one. And we are going to assume that CC has already been searched, right? This is the only caveat in the whole Bloom filter problem. There is a chance that the string, which has not been searched earlier, will be called as searched. Okay. What's the probability of that? So what is the probability of this actually happening? Um, for the, the probability of a string going through a hash function and then setting a bit to one is one by m, right? You have m positions, you set a bit, that's one by m. So the probability of you not setting a bit is one minus one by m, right? So this, this is the probability of a bit not being set by that hash for a given string. You pass this through k hash functions, right? So this is the probability that a particular bit will not be set at all by one string, which is passed through k hash functions. And if you pass it through i strings, which is i insertions, so the probability that a given bit is not set after passing i strings through k hash functions is this quantity, right? Now, what we are interested in is the error rate, the rate at which the, the probability of us going wrong. So this is equal to whatever this quantity is. This is, this is the quantity of you not setting the bit. What you are interested in is you by mistake setting the bit. So this is one minus this entire quantity. All right, but not just that. One minus this entire quantity is the chance of you not by mistake reaching a one in a single hash function. So when you have a new string, you're going to actually do this k times, right? So this is into k. Take your time if you want, you can repeat the steps again and again, but just understand in depth that uh, the probability over here is 1 minus this quantity raised to power k into i raised to power k, right? Now for the final bit, just let's understand how this function is working. Uh, if m tends to infinity, which means your hash range is infinity, this quantity is 1 by infinity, which is 0, 1 minus 0 is 1, raised to the power anything is 1, 1 minus that is 0, raised to the power anything is 0. So as m tends to infinity, the error rate tends to zero. Similarly, if n tends to zero, the error rate tends to, if m is zero, rather m zero being a, is a really weird thing. So m should be one, because at least you need one place to hash the thing at. One by one, zero. One minus that is one. Raised to power anything is one. 1 minus 1 is 0, raised to power k is 0. So, or rather, raised to power k is 1. So, if you have just one position, then the error rate is 1, which means there's a 100% chance that you'll have an error, right? Because the second time anything comes in, it has to be in the same place, error rate is 1. What happens, on the other hand, if, let us choose some arbitrary numbers, k is equal to 3, m is equal to 5 times of n and n itself is equal to 1000. Alright, so m is equal to basically 5000. And so we have these three numbers. Uh, i will be equal to half of n, which is 500. Alright, so you're halfway through your insertions. What happens? What you're going to have is this quantity will become 1 upon m, which is 5000. So this entire quantity becomes 4999 by 5000. 1 minus this quantity, not really, because this is at an exponent. So k is, as we said, 3. 3 into halfway through is 500. So that is in a result 1500, uh, again k over here is 3. 
So the answer to this is equal to 0 0.017. So this is 1.7%. Uh, so the error rate with three hash functions for n equal to 1000 and you using just five times that space, which is a Boolean array actually, uh, is going to be 1.7% halfway through. Right, so with this you can play around. What happens if I increase k to 4? So this becomes 2000 now. Uh, this stay is the same and this becomes 4. Now the error rate changes. 0 0.0118. So this is again 1.18%. k being 4 helped you reduce the error rate. Finally, let's take k equal to 20. So what we are doing is we are trying to graph uh, the values of error rate at different values of k. So k20 gives you, this is the same, this is 520, which is 1000, 10,000. And this is raised to power 20. So this value is going to be, in fact, um, 0. 0, 0.054, which is 5.4%. So the error rate here was 1.7%. It reduced to 1.18% when k became 4 from, from k equal to 3 to k equal to 4. And at k equal to 20, it became 5.4%. So there is an optimal value of k. And that is given by m by n log 2 right now this uh, this requires maths which is beyond the scope of this video what happens is if you differentiate this equation then you're probably going to get an optimal value of k but yeah this is the best k value and so that's it for bloom filters uh, if you have any doubts or suggestions you can have a look in the description below it also has the code um, best of luck